Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Today was day 59 of the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings and it was a big day. It featured the National Commissioner of the RCMP, Brenda Lucky, uh, testifying. She testified starting uh, late in the morning and then went on until uh, it's now just about uh, 10 to 6. Uh, she finished up just a few minutes ago in her testimony. Uh, some of her cross-examination with uh, Michael Scott from Patterson Law. And there'll be more uh, from uh, Commissioner Lucky tomorrow. Other uh, participants' lawyers will have an opportunity to ask questions in cross-examination. Today, Commissioner Lucky was asked uh, questions by the Mass Casualty Commission lawyer, Rachel Young. But uh, before that, we, uh, had, uh, we heard more from the commanding officer of the Nova Scotia RCMP at the time of the events of the mass casualty, and that is uh, retired Assistant Commissioner Lee Bergerman. Now, I spoke about uh, Ms. Bergerman yesterday, and she testified for the full day yesterday, came back this morning. It was interesting, like uh, most witnesses, they, you know, the mass casualty commission lawyer will ask questions and then if anybody else is allowed to cross-examine them, then the other lawyers will cross-examine. And then sometimes the commissioners may have, all right, well, just one or two things I, I, they thought of. A couple of minutes, you know, two or three questions at the end. Often the commissioners just say, all right, thank you. I don't, don't have any questions and they move on. Well, yesterday at the end of uh, Ms. Bergerman's testimony, the commissioner says, well, come back at 9.30 tomorrow. We may have a few questions. I was curious because it was only around four o'clock why they didn't ask their questions at that time. Well, the answer is because they had a lot of questions. They spoke, uh, asked questions of Ms. Bergerman, uh, retired uh, Assistant Commissioner Bergerman for close to two hours, which is about the same length of time as she spent in her direct examination with the Mass Casualty Commission lawyer, Rachel Young, yesterday. So uh, there was lots of uh, questions uh, asked of Ms. Bergerman and then we got into Brenda Lucky. So it was a really interesting contrast, I thought, of the, the two leaders, the commanding officer for the RCMP in Nova Scotia, the commissioner of the RCMP nationally. Uh, Ms. Bergerman, who is now retired, seems to have gone off to some remote corner of the planet, could be somewhere here in Guysborough County without any cell service or internet coverage, and hasn't been paying attention to anything. Uh, throughout uh, her retirement of the last close to a year uh, and didn't have uh, many answers. She showed a real lack of curiosity, uh, was given a lot of vague answers, didn't seem to have looked into the events of the mass casualty, even though she was the head of the RCMP in Nova Scotia at that time, had not conducted any reviews, wasn't really aware of the, uh, I think we found out up to eight internal uh, reviews, internal to the RCMP or else internal to the federal government collectively, internal reviews that are ongoing, none of which have been completed. She uh, wasn't really aware of any of those and didn't seem again to show much curiosity as to what might be learned or any of those things uh, by the commission, by the RCMP about their response uh, the response operationally and their response in terms of public communications, which is where you would think the leadership of the RCMP would really um, be engaged, uh, is, is in the communications with the public. So, uh, so that was uh, Ms. Bergman. She was on the stand again, but like I say, for close to two hours this morning. Uh, the commissioners, I could see, were really puzzled by the, the sort of lack of after-action reports, the lack of curiosity that Ms. Bergerman displayed uh, yesterday and then uh, I guess throughout her uh, pre-retirement. But before she actually got to testify, there was a legal issue that came up. Uh, Ms. Young uh, stood up before the testimony started and said, well, last night at 9.30, they received, the commission received, uh, commission lawyers received from the Federal Department of Justice notes from Ms. Bergerman that, that carried the time from October 2020 up until her retirement. So close to a year's worth of notes, any meetings, any discussions that she would have had about the mass casualty uh, events, the you know upcoming at that time commission, all of these reviews, none of those notes had been displayed, uh, had been uh, disclosed. So another issue here of the federal government, the Department of Justice, 
failing to disclose relevant information to the Mass Casualty Commission. You could tell right away the commissioners uh, were not very happy with that. Uh, but, I mean, we're in the middle of a witness, and so what do you do? Commissioner McDonald says, well, what, are, what do we have? we have? We just have to roll with it. But they did have some questions. Uh, that certainly covered part of it. There was no opportunity, by the way, to take those notes, give them out to the parties, and allow anybody time to you know, read through them, come up with questions, figure out, you know, how does this connect with that, and, and all the work you would put into a proper examination. You need these notes, you know, much more in advance, usually, you know, weeks or months, but uh, at least a few days to go through the other material if you're preparing for a witness. So uh, that uh, that will reflect badly uh, again on the uh, Department of Justice, the Federal Department of Justice, which has been um, getting attention for the wrong reasons uh, for not providing proper disclosure to the Mass Casualty Commission. Uh, Commissioner Stanton also asked this is another thing. So yesterday, if you were listening to the video, you said like basically every answer that uh, Ms. Bergerman gave was, well, if we only had more money, if we only had more resources, we could do that, that, and that. Okay. So Commissioner Stanton says, well, have you ever thought about reimagining the way policing works within existing budgets? And uh, Ms. Bergerman started to talk a little bit and really came down. Well, you know. If we were to make a transition into another form of policing, we'd sure need a lot of resources in order to do that. So, um, no would have been the short answer. Uh, no, she is not in the leadership position, a uh, commanding officer for a provincial police force, effectively, uh, had not turned her mind to any sort of creative thinking about how policing might evolve or change or, or just adjust to the times and the criticisms that the RCMP has been receiving in recent years. So, uh, but she's retired uh, and that's that was it. Now, at the end of her testimony, this is a little after 11 o'clock this morning, Ms. Bergerman tried to squeeze in a little uh, expression of condolence. Uh, she started off, uh, you know, it was like, all right, well, that was the end of the questions. And she's like, well, I would like to, she said she wanted to thank the commissioners for allowing her to speak her truth, which was a really weird way of putting it. You're, I don't know if it's cultural appropriation necessarily to use the phrase, but it doesn't seem appropriate uh, in terms of, you know, a police officer giving witness testimony. They're not supposed, you're not giving, you know, you're not telling a story, you're giving the truth, the facts as you remember them as best you can go through the documents and all those things. So uh, that was a little strange. So she said, I'd like to thank the commissioners for allowing me to speak, speak my truth. And then she tr gave an expression of, she wanted to express her condolences to the families. And she had a brief moment of emotion, but if she had anything more to say at that point, Commissioner McDonald was having none of it. Uh, as soon as she paused to take a breath, she, he said, okay, well, we're on break and, uh, and shut things down. So uh, that was that. So that may be an indication of the way that the commission had viewed her evidence. Certainly, uh, like I say, the fact that they took so long to talk to her was uh, relevant. Then, uh, the, the more high profile witness, I'm sure lots of people were watching the uh, testimony of uh, National RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky. Uh, like I've said in other uh, videos, I, I met Ms. Lucky, uh, Commissioner Lucky, uh, six years ago, uh, no, five years ago, 2017, out in uh, Depo, where she was the head of Depo at the time, visited there for a weekend, and uh, uh, just met her very briefly. Um, she, I thought, was, it was a really interesting contrast between the two. So Ms. Bergerman, very vague answers, hadn't looked into anything. Uh, Ms. Lucky, on the other hand, gave long and detailed answers, was a high energy witness, had lots to say, had clearly thought about the range of her responsibilities as commissioner of the RCMP and was prepared to talk about it. Uh, so that was a, a very stark contrast. So that really informs a lot of other things. So whenever there was an issue of, well, was the Nova Scotia leadership team of the RCMP uh, right or was the national leadership team of the RCMP right when there's disputes? Well, just looking at the two commanding officers, uh, the comparison certainly did not favor Ms. Bergerman. Um, you know, Brenda Lucky gave detailed answers to the questions. Uh, 
she was eager to answer the questions and uh, I thought, you know, had a, a good handle on her files. So, uh, be interested to see what others thought of, of that. One curious thing, and I've noticed, so I've been watching, of course, the commission hearings. I've also been watching the parliamentary hearings where these officers like Chris Leather, Darren Campbell, uh, Leah Bergerman, and Brenda Lucky have all appeared before the parliamentary committee looking into political interference allegations. When they're in Ottawa, they're wearing their uniforms. They're wearing their their uh, their blue uh, you know dress uniform of the RCMP uh, commanders. But here in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, they come down to testify the Mass Casualty Commission, and they're wearing civilian clothing. Notice that with uh, Brenda Lucky today, she wasn't wearing her uniform. Not sure what the strategy is exactly behind that, if it's to make her seem more relatable in some way or, or what it is, but uh, it's curious. I mean, you're you're there in your official role as commissioner of the RCMP. I think it'd be more appropriate to be wearing the uniform. Um, not sure what that's trying to prove otherwise. Now, she was asked a lot of the same questions that Ms. Bergerman was yesterday. And I talked yesterday about some of the really softball questions that Rachel Young asked Ms. Bergerman. Like, do you think it's capable of changing? And can, can this organization change? And uh, Ms. Bergerman was just like, oh, yes, of course we can. Like, uh, I compared it to a small child answering questions from a parent. Well, Ms. Lucky was much different. She pointed to this major strategic initiative. She called it Vision 150. It's on their website talking about changing police. Uh, people, culture, stewardship, and policing services. She talked about how if you want change to happen, you have to track it, you have to measure it, that sometimes there's lots of excitement in the first three to five months, but then things waver, so you really need a process in place to make sure things happen when they're supposed to happen, that there's accountability. And then she says you invite the public in as well, so that there's public accountability, because there's you know, not just internal uh, watching uh, going on, but external as well. So that seems to be her approach, uh, her stated approach, at least to the Vision 150 initiatives that she's taking. She talked about the, uh, the numbers of uh, female commanding officers that has improved uh, since she joined the RCMP uh, in 1986, I think she said. And, uh, you know, there's diversity, not only, uh, not only gender diversity, not only the, uh, you know, racial diversity, but also there's diversity on her leadership team of uh, RCMP members, but also civilian members that are giving her advice as well. So she, uh, she's done that purposefully, according to her. Uh, that's part of her leadership style. And like I say, she answered questions at length, spoke in specific detail. Uh, she talked about the reviews that are ongoing as well, uh, these, these eight different internal reviews. She said some of the smaller reviews, yes, they're underway. Some of uh, the these larger reviews, she thought, well, rather than having people interview two or three times for the, each different review, do some of them, do the smaller ones, do the Mass Casualty Commission review that's ongoing at the RCMP in which they're participating. And then if some of these others, after the fact, still need to happen, then they'll be done. Some of them might be document reviews. So, Again, compared to Ms. Bergerman, who's just like, oh, yeah, it's in two and a half years. Yeah, maybe those should be done by now. I don't know why they're not. Um, Ms. Lucky, uh, Commissioner Lucky had detailed answers about those things. And uh, reasoning, some reasoning, whether you accept the reasoning or not, at least she had reasoning behind um, some of the decisions that were being made. So I thought that was important. Uh, you know, these other reviews she expects will uh, take place if gaps remain after the uh, Mass Casualty Commission has completed its work. And uh, so she said also, though, like, they're not waiting on some of the more. So you don't, they, she said, well, we don't want to go do things and change things internally and then have the commission recommend that we take a different path. And thus we've wasted uh, time and, and maybe made things worse. But she said on some things like the alert ready system. There is now uh, a national policy. I would argue it's not uh, quite, uh, it's not not quite responsive enough to the situation. For example, in Portapik, uh, it would have been important for the constable on the ground, the acting uh, corporal, to have access to the alert ready system to be able to issue an alert. That's not the national policy, but at least there is a national policy. They thought about it. They've tried to make changes. So that's something they've done while they're waiting for the Mass Casualty Commission to complete its work. 
So that was interesting. Uh, the major thing, though, that, of course, everybody was looking for Ms. Lucky to, uh, to answer was about these allegations of political interference. And, you know, there was, so there was the press conferences that were being held in Nova Scotia, led by the communications and leadership of the Nova Scotia RCMP. The impression from Ms. Lucky, and we saw this at the uh, parliamentary hearings, but those were, she had, she had five minutes to talk, she had a few minutes to answer questions. Today she had hours. That there was a great deal of frustration at the national level, at the communications level, where they're used to thinking in these strategic communications terms with the performance of the Nova Scotia RCMP leadership team and the communications people. They were very frustrated because the narrative was uh, forming a very negative narrative against the RCMP. And it was felt that in Ottawa that a great deal of this was a result of poor communications rather than withholding information or giving improper information to be more forthcoming. And of those, you know, those bits of information, the, the weapons that, you know, that's become the focal point. Well, the make and model of the weapons and Ms. Lucky, uh, Commissioner Lucky, sorry, passed that on to the public safety minister. Now, she did speak about that specifically because we've heard that, uh, you know, this wasn't supposed to be disseminated outside of the RCMP. And here she is passing it on to uh, her, her political master as well. Uh, she didn't uh, have anything at that point when she uh, passed it on to the public safety minister that suggested that it couldn't be shared outside the RCMP. So Commissioner Lucky didn't seem to have done anything personally wrong there. Uh, and then when she did pass the information on, she said it shouldn't be passed on any further than the public safety minister and the prime minister's office. So uh, don't know if a lot is going to come out of that specific point about disclosing things outside of the RCMP, but uh, certainly there was uh, some focus on the weapons because, uh, you know, that question is asked at all times after a mass casualty incident, what kind of weapons were being used and what, uh, what you know, where were they acquired, how was that done, all those things. And uh, the government had uh, legislation coming in and so they wanted to know. But the, the point Commissioner Lucky made was she had been told by uh, the communications people through the RCP in Nova Scotia that these makes and models were going to be identified during the press conference. And so she passed that information on to the public safety minister. When it wasn't done, then uh, from Commissioner Lucky's perspective, she had misinformed the public safety minister and she didn't like that. And so that was her complaint. Part of the complaint. Part of the complaint was that specific point, but the broader complaint was, you know, you're not providing enough information to the public and you're not being forthcoming and proactive in providing that information. So uh, the narrative was becoming negative uh, towards the RCMP and, and so she felt more details should have been released and that would have countered that negative. Now, in cross-examination with Michael Scott, one of the things was asked early on was, well, a negative narrative isn't necessarily an unfair narrative. If two police officers shoot at a fire hall, well, it's the event, not the reporting of the event. And Ms. Luck uh, Commissioner Lucky sorry, agreed with that, that it was, uh, yes, events can be themselves just reported accurately and that can reflect negatively on uh, whoever caused the event. But things can be explained. You know, if, uh, if there was an alternate explanation, if there was something else going on, she didn't use the alert ready system uh, as an explanation, as an example, sorry, of that. But, you know, if there's a reason why it might not have been issued, well, at least you explain that to people and whether they accept the explanation or not, at least you've tried to do so. Uh, but she agreed that just because something was negative doesn't mean it was necessarily unfair. Uh, I thought it was really interesting, actually, I was listening to her testimony and, you know, she talked about this conference call, this, this now, I guess, infamous conference call with uh, the Nova Scotia leadership team of the RCMP, where, you know, she was critical of them and saying they weren't doing their jobs properly and not, uh, you know. So, you know, when, when she was doing that, I, th I she reflected after the fact, after she, she gets Leah Scanlon's letter and she's hearing these negative reports. Uh, this is a year afterwards, but then she reflects back. She's like, well, 
maybe I could have done the call differently. I should have mixed in some positive messaging along with the, the negative messages that the negative messages that had to be passed on. I mean, she's the leader of the organization. If something's happening and she doesn't say something, uh, then she's not doing her job. She's not fulfilling her responsibilities. But if she's, you know, she was self-reflective, she's like, well, I could have done a little better. Maybe I mixed in some positives. Uh, maybe I could have waited a day to do it or, you know, all those things, right? Because, um, you know, so I kind of, I, I appreciate it. I think the commissioners will appreciate that instinct that Ms. Uh, Commissioner Lucky seems to have at least to uh, to be self-reflective and, uh, and self-critical. Uh, she wishes that she had sent the national communications team to Halifax to assist with all of the media calls that were coming in and helping prepare people for press conferences, that sort of thing. She was worried at the time that they would spread COVID uh, potentially to Nova Scotia. That was the early days of the pandemic. And in fact, uh, that did happen with the uh, RCMP officers from Quebec and I think other places that were brought in to relieve the many uh, Nova Scotia RCMP officers who took leave after the events and uh, they spread COVID when they got here. So that was, uh, I guess, maybe she was right about that. But um, anyway, she, she was reflecting on all of those things and wishing she had done things a little differently. But on, on the core message of you know, whether there was political interference, she, uh, no, uh, resounding no to that. Uh, there was questions being asked and, and reasonable questions in her mind being asked, but not interference. And then she herself wasn't applying pressure. And in fact, the Nova Scotia RCMP leadership team, um, whether there was, uh, whether they felt pressure to release the, the firearm, make some models or whatever, they didn't do it. So it, no political interference ended up being enacted. So um, we may be making too much out of that angle of things. And I'll be curious to see how much how much ink the commissioners give to that angle, if any, in their uh, final report. So the, you know, the bigger issues, uh, well, also, the one other thing that she said, uh, she was, you know, and the other thing, Commissioner Lucky was also trying to understand the mistakes that the uh, Nova Scotia RCP made in their press conferences and she said you know well do we have police officers were trained to be perfectly accurate when we give information and there's a, a culture of perfection and the fear of giving the wrong information and so um, maybe they were being too cautious and that sort of comes from the culture a little bit as well so something else she may be looking to uh, change in the course of her leadership now I mean the so the, the political interference angle I think distracts a little bit from the core issue which is the RCMP not wanting to give information out. I mean there's you know Commissioner Lucky herself uh, you know was said well it wasn't this they were under investigation I had to give information she said well there's a little more nuance to that I mean yes just because there's an active investigation doesn't mean you can say nothing about something you can say give some details uh, and not all or the most critical details or things that might tip off somebody who's under investigation there's there's not just a blanket answer every time something's under investigation, uh, which I always say that, you know, it's the same as when something is before the courts and you can't say anything. Well, of course you can. You can say something. You can't, there's probably things you can't say, but you, you don't just say nothing. Uh, it's just an excuse. Same with the RCMP in this case, their excuse of saying that it was under investigation was um, just a, a blanket excuse to refuse to answer questions. The other thing that was uh, brought briefly to Commissioner Lucky's attention was the fact that this, it wasn't the makes and models that was the issue anyway. Uh, it was that Wartman got these guns from smuggling them across the border and that's the real issue and nobody's really addressed that yet and um, so neither has the uh, Mass Casualty Commission. So we'll see. We'll see if any of that changes. None of that was going to be addressed in the gun legislation that the federal government was uh, toting at the time and so uh, we'll see whether any of that uh, makes um, makes the final report as well, or uh, any of the proceedings over the coming weeks. So, uh, I've gone long uh, as uh, I thought I might. The the written piece is also a little longer than usual, but it was a busy day with the two leaders of uh, the Nova Scotia RCMP and the National RCMP, and it was a really interesting day. Tomorrow, Commissioner Lucky is back on the stand. I'll suspect uh, expect she'll be on the stand for a good chunk of the day, 
uh, answering maybe some of the same questions. We'll see what the other uh, lawyers have to ask her, but um, that's, uh, that's that. So that was it. Day 59 of the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings. Really interesting stuff. I'll be interested in your feedback on all of this. And uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for watching. <laughs> thank you for listening, and we'll uh, see you next time.